Open your Bibles with me, please, to Exodus chapter 3 tonight. Exodus chapter 3. We'll get there pretty soon. A couple of weeks back, I uh, preached a message about the fatal flaws of the Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, I need some more research and study time before I present part two of that message. So I'm not going to do that tonight. Um, some were expecting me to do that and looking, looking forward to that, but it's not going to happen tonight. I do hope, hopefully, Lord willing, this week to get some time to to get back into that. And hopefully I'll bring part two of that message next week, Lord willing. But for tonight I have another message, which I think is actually more needed, more timely, more appropriate right now at this point in time in America's history. In Exodus chapter 3, I'm going to start reading in verse 1. It says, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he, God said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet. For the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land into a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now, therefore... Behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. By the way, note the use of that word ye. That's plural. That means all of you, all the children of Israel. Verse 13, And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say unto me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob has sent me unto you. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial. My memorial unto all generations. I want to talk tonight about that word memorial. This past May 25th uh, was the day America recognizes as Memorial Day. Personally, I'm grateful for Memorial Day. I'm grateful for all other holidays also that shut down the courthouses and give me a day to catch up on my work, or actually take a day to spend with my family. Uh, Officially, Memorial Day is a federal holiday in the United States, established for remembering uh, the people who died while serving in the country's armed forces. The, The holiday, observed every year on the last Monday in May, originated as Decoration Day after the war between the states in 1868, as a time for the nation to decorate the graves of the war dead with flowers. By the 20th century, however, 
uh, competing Union and Confederate holiday traditions celebrated on different days had merged and Memorial Day was established as a federal holiday to honor all Americans who died while in the military service. As for the official designated purpose of Memorial Day, the American people need to know that every major war that America has been engaged in, including the American War for Independence from Britain, and especially including the Civil War or the war between the states, World Wars I and II, Korea, Vietnam, which, by the way, the powers that be would not allow the U.S. to win, Persian Gulf Wars I and II against Saddam Hussein, and also this current concocted war against a concocted enemy named ISIS, have all been pre-planned and pre-engineered by the unseen hand that works through various secret societies and orders of Freemasonry. The Jesuit order headquartered at the Vatican in Rome that controls those same organizations. To dominate and to control world politics and to move the entire planet into the so-called New World Order that is boldly and, by the way, without apology, symbolized on the back of every U.S. dollar bill. And that is and will be the devil's global government of the Antichrist. That's prophesied in Revelation chapter 13, verse 7, which says that this man of sin, this son of perdition, will be given power and authority over all kindreds and tongues and nations. There will be a global government under this man, the Bible says. And unfortunately, I have to say that while they did not know it, while they were deceived into believing that they were fighting for a good cause, for the most part, the hundreds of thousands of military veterans who died or lost their limbs or their lives in these wars did so for the wrong cause. All of these wars have been engineered and designed to bring this planet ever closer to the New World Order, global government of the Antichrist. Both sides of all of these wars were dominated and run by high-degree Freemasons directed from the top down by the superior general of the Jesuit order. George Washington is one of the most celebrated and honored of American Freemasons. You thought I was going to say presidents, didn't you? Freemasons. He was a Freemason. As was Benjamin Franklin and many other of the founding fathers of America. Napoleon Bonaparte, the French emperor who conquered Europe and then actually restored the Jesuit order after it had been disbanded, was also a high degree Freemason. Napoleon's brother, Joseph Napoleon Bonaparte, appointed king of Naples, Sicily, and Spain by his brother the emperor, was also a grand master of the Grand Orient Lodge in France. High degree Freemason. The great battle of Waterloo between uh, Napoleon, between his armies and uh, the British, was commanded on both sides by generals who were high degree Freemasons. The American Civil War that resulted in the abolition of both state sovereignty, state rights, and personal sovereignty, and the creation of a federal citizenship through the 14th Amendment, the abolition of habeas corpus, and a continual state of national emergency and dictatorial war powers in Washington, D.C. Both sides of that war, north and south, uh, were directed and funded by Rothschild banks. In other words, by the Vatican who ended up being, by the way, the biggest winner of that war with almost complete total control over Washington, D.C. World War I, instigated by Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany, also a high-degree Freemason, along with his predecessor, Kaiser Friedrich III, who was also a high-degree Freemason. The co-conspirators in World War I, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was the Secretary of War in the United States, and Winston Churchill, Secretary of the Navy in Britain, each of which were chief military secretaries at the time, collaborated, by the way, in the sinking of the Lusitania uh, to bring the U.S. into that war, World War I. As they did, those two again uh, conspired again to bring America into World War II. The perpetrators of World War II, Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and Winston Churchill, all these men were high-degree Freemasons. Right. FDR, again, by the way, had advanced knowledge of uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor and purposely let it happen, again, to bring America into that war as well. By the way, if you think FDR is a national hero, 
you need to look at the back of a dollar bill, look at the occultic New World Order symbology on the back of that dollar bill. And remember, it was under FDR's watch. It was FDR that put that symbology on the dollar bill. Hitler himself was Jesuit trained in a secret puppet of the Vatican who said he patterned his SS after the Jesuits. And that Heinrich Himmler, the, his Reichsfuhrer, the head, head of the SS, was his Ignatius of Loyola, who founded the Jesuits, by the way. American politicians, Al Gore, Newt Gingrich, Bob Dole, Jack Kemp, Strom Thurmond, Colin Powell, Jesse Helms, Barry Goldwater, and many others, all of them high-degree Freemasons. Most American presidents have been high-degree Freemasons, including George Bush's one and two, both of them, also in Skull and Bones Society, as we know, Bill and Hillary Clinton, high-degree Freemasons, Eastern Star, George Washington, James Monroe, Andrew Jackson, James Polk, James Buchanan, Andrew Johnson, James Garfield, William McKinley, Teddy Roosevelt, William Taft, Warren Harding, FDR, Harry Truman, Lyndon Johnson, Gerald Ford, and Ronald Reagan, the great actor. The first American president, by the way, to take his oath, oath of office facing the, the west, on the west side of the Capitol, facing the obelisk of the Washington Monument, as all presidents since have also done now. All of them have been high-degree Freemasons and therefore dedicated by blood oaths to their god, Lucifer, to his new world order. Leaders of other nations as well. Neville Chamberlain of Britain. Tony Blair of Britain. Shimon Peres, Isaac Rabin. Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel. High degree Freemasons. Karl Marx, who wrote the Communist Manifesto. Freemason. Frederick Engels. Gerhard Schroeder and Helmut Kohl of Germany. Mikhail Gorbachev, Joseph Stalin. And Vladimir Lenin of Russia. All of them high degree Freemasons. Saddam Hussein, by the way. Yasser Arafat. High degree Freemasons. All these men were high degree Freemasons, all of them working toward that same goal, the destruction of true Christianity and the imposition of the devil's new world order. This current concocted war against this new concocted enemy called ISIS itself is a huge ruse and a deception. As stated in previous messages, ISIS is the best enemy American dollars can buy. It is a direct product of American ingenuity. In actuality, ISIS is the direct creation of American and British intelligence. It has been 100% funded, equipped, and trained, directly or indirectly, by American dollars for the purpose of destabilizing the Syrian region to take down Syria's President Assad and to bring about a regime change in Syria of the type that has already been done in Iraq, uh, Egypt, and Libya. By the way, this past Monday also, May 25th, on his Liberty Report, even the esteemed Congressman Ron Paul released additional information uh, showing that ISIS is, in fact, a, U a U.S.-backed and supported concocted enemy. Ron Paul even came out with that. American pilots are not being allowed to engage ISIS military forces on the ground, even when they're spotted. They're being told that to, to all, all they're doing is bombing empty buildings. This so-called air campaign we're waging over there against ISIS. They're just, they're just bombing empty buildings. They're not being allowed to actually engage the enemy. So it's one, two, three, what are we fighting for? What are we fighting for? If you ask me, I'll say that I do care and that we are not fighting for anyone's freedom. Whenever I hear the very sad news of another young man being injured or killed in these made-up wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and soon to be on the ground in the Syrian region. I have to say, why? Why are we there? Why are American military forces deployed in these regions? I'll tell you why. It's to further the agenda of the globalist elite and to build the devil's new world order. And now that agenda is moving into the next phase here at home with what the Pentagon is calling the Jade Helm 15 military exercises being conducted in several U.S. states, initially planned only for the southwest states of Texas, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, Arizona, Nevada, and California, uh, to last originally from July 15th until September 15th. Uh, but now that also includes Florida, by the way. They've added Florida to that list of states, and it may possibly start in June rather than July. 
By the way, tomorrow is June 1st. So it's coming right up. This exercise involves several branches of the military, including the 82nd Airborne Division, Navy SEALs, Green Berets, and other special ops divisions. Internet sites are pretty much ablaze with a reasonable concern that these exercises will transition into the onset of martial law. Some factors fueling this alarm. Number one, no drill this extensive has ever occurred on U.S. soil before, involving thousands of troops. Number two, it includes nighttime activities, airdrops near towns, and attempts to infiltrate and blend in with civilian populations. By the way, the only reason they need to blend in with civilian populations is so they can extract dissidents and intern them in concentration camps. That's the only reason they need to blend in with the civilian population. So they can carry out assassination, hit, hit teams, etc. Number three, the exercise is unlawful as it violates the Posse Comitatus Act, which prohibits the domestic deployment of federal troops in civilian areas. Section four of the Constitution allows it in cases of domestic violence. But uh, that's clearly not the situation here. This is not constitutional. Number four, the operations field map is labeled Texas, Utah, and certain Southern California counties as hostile territory, which is a bit troubling since these areas also happen to contain populations that are especially patriotic or constitutionalist. There's a lot of theorizing and speculation on the Internet as to whether or not these exercises will directly lead to the imposition of martial law, uh, possible suspension of habeas corpus and another declared state of national emergency, Presumably ending up in, in rounding up and in, in the internment of all dissidents opposed to the police state. Steve Quayle is, of course, uh, at the forefront with his voice, uh, again saying that his unnamed anonymous friends in the military are telling him that this exercise will, without doubt, go operational into full-scale martial law. So that they're saying that his, his scenario is that it's going to result from a, a uh, crash of the, of the U.S. dollar and the imposition of the wand. I don't think that's going to happen. Other theories, uh, scenarios being tossed around are the possibility of, uh, well, the currency collapse, major earthquake, or also attacks within the United States uh, by ISIS. Now, I'll tell you, after listening to Steve Quayle for the past 20 years, uh, after listening to him give multiple false alarms based on alleged inside info from his unnamed sources in the military, uh, I'm very wary of the boy that cried wolf too many times. And so I'm a bit, I'm very wary of Steve Quayle. But that said, I do believe this summer we should be prepared for the possibility that these things could happen. Never before has an exercise of this magnitude been implemented on American soil. We're seeing, if you go on the internet, you can see videos people are sending it to Alex Jones and Infowars, etc., that they're taking footage of long trains with filled with tanks, military gear, uh, military vehicles, all over the country. This is happening. Uh, there's a lot of movement of uh, military armaments around, and uh, it just appears that something is it you know is getting ready to happen. But back to Memorial Day. As for Memorial Day, I think it is good to take a day to remember our fallen soldiers. But I do think that we need to be balanced. I need, I ask, actually, I'm also going to ask this church and those that hear this message for some grace and for some balance in our view of how we, how we view those who serve in the military. First of all, Christians in general need to wake up to the true agenda of those that run this nation and that run the, the um, America's military. Christians need to understand that the, that the U.S. military is being used for wicked purposes. And it's my opinion that knowing this agenda that Christians in this day should not join the military. That's my opinion. On the other hand, we who do know the truth need to remember that many, if not most, of the men who served in the military have done so with the most honorable of intentions. To defend their families and what they thought was their country. We need to remember that. This is Independence Baptist Church. Because we declare our independence from the state and our total dependence upon the head of this church, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This is Independence Baptist Church. This is not Westboro Baptist Church in Topeka, Kansas. Amen. 
We are not going to stage public protests carrying signs that say, thank God for dead soldiers and pray for more dead soldiers like these unbalanced morons from Westboro Baptist Church in Topeka, Kansas have done. I would venture a guess that less than 1% of the men who joined the military may perhaps think of themselves as mercenaries for the New World Order. Possibly. Uh, though that is what many of them do, in fact, become. Uh, but the 2,300 men that lost their lives in the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941 did not think of themselves as mercenaries for the New World Order. Uh, nor did the 2,500 men that lost their lives in the D-Day invasion when they stormed the beach of Normandy. Admittedly, many of those who join the military these days do so because they feel they have no other option. They can't afford college, they can't get a good job, and they sign up for a couple of years so they can go to college on the GI Bill. But guess what? Many of the young men in the military come from good homes where they were taught the U.S. Constitution that is hated by the globalist powers that are now in control of the U.S. military. And some young men in the military actually understand the oaths that they gave to support and defend the Constitution from all enemies, foreign and domestic. We've all heard about the many men in the military who have been asked if they would be willing to fire on American citizens if called upon to do so. And the many soldiers, by the way, who said they would not do so. But the military is going to step beyond that now. Uh, the Pentagon conducted a study as recently as uh, 2012 and found that 60% of active duty Army, 60% of active duty Army, 80% of the National Guard, 25% of the Air Force, and 90% of active duty Marines will side with the American people in the event of a civil war. Meaning, an armed conflict between the American people and the military police state of Washington, D.C. You may disagree with me, that's fine, but I'd say at this point, perhaps, in our history, we may need men in the military that know the Bible and know the Constitution that they, and know that they ultimately answer to a higher authority than their commanding officer. That's right. And who will be willing, by the way, to give their lives to defend their home, their families, their heritage, and the U.S. Constitution. And who will stand by the American people if civil war does erupt. I think we need men like that in the military right now, perhaps. Something to think about. It's good to remember fallen soldiers. Especially those who gave their lives to defend what they thought was their country. But I think it's more important for us at this point in history. With what we see coming, with what we see happening in our world what we see confronting us to remember what God says about His memorial. What God says about His memorial. That brings us back to Exodus chapter 3, verse 13. Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you. And they shall say unto me, What is His name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me unto you. This is my name forever, God says. And this is my memorial unto all generations. This is a very interesting, profound, and an important revelation to Moses of who God is and of what his name means. God, in fact, answers Moses' question first by telling him what his name means and then, tell, and then telling him what it is. In verse 14, God gives a partial declaration of the meaning of his name, which is then given in verse 15, what some call the Tetragrammaton. Yahweh, or Jehovah, as translated in a few places in the King James Version. In verse uh, 15, God's name is shown in the standard form of Lord in all capital letters. It's also translated, or actually transliterated, in four other places in the King James Bible uh, as Jehovah. We'll look at one of those passages in a moment. The scholars say that the actual pronunciation of God's name is no longer known. Perhaps it's better pronounced Yahweh. But as for me, I'm quite comfortable using the King James term Jehovah. Just as, by the way, I'm also happy using uh, the name that my Savior revealed himself to me by, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. 
I don't believe I have to use the name Yeshua HaMashiach in order for my prayers to be heard. God says to Moses, My name is Jehovah, and I am that I am. My name Jehovah means that I am the self-existent one, without beginning, without end, without need of any other. Matthew Henry says this of that blessed name. I am that I am. This explains his name Jehovah and signifies one, that he is self-existent. He has his being of himself and has no dependence upon any other. The greatest and best man in the world must say, by the grace of God, I am what I am. But God says absolutely. And it is more than any creature, man, or angel can say, I am that I am. Being self-existent, he cannot be but self-deficient. And therefore all self-sufficient and the inexhaustible fountain of being and bliss. That's how Matthew Henry describes the name. Number two, it means that he is eternal and unchangeable. Always the same, yesterday, today, and forever. He will be what he will be and what he is. Number three, Matthew Henry says that we cannot, by searching, find him out. This is such a name. This is such a name as checks all bold and curious inquiries concerning God. And in effect says, ask not after my name, seeing it is secret, as he said to Manoah. Gil. Gil puts it this way in his commentary. I am that I am. This signifies the real being of God, his self-existence, and that he is the being of beings. It also denotes his eternity and, Im- Im- and immutability. That means he doesn't change. He's immutable. And his constancy and his faithfulness in fulfilling his promises. For it includes all time, past, present, and to come. And the sense is not only I am what I am at the present, but I am what I have been. And I am what I shall be. And I shall be what I am. That's an interesting way to put it. But beyond these definitions, however, I believe God is saying to Moses, when the children of Israel ask you, who's going to deliver us out of bondage? You tell them that the God who says, I am the eternal and self-existent one who delivers his people out of bondage is going to deliver them. Who has no need to bow to Pharaoh or to ask Pharaoh's permission to let my people go. He has sent me to you to let you know that your prayers have been heard and you are about to be delivered. Turn to chapter 6, please. Chapter 6. We see some more light shed on the meaning here of the name Jehovah. In chapter 5, we see Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go. Pharaoh says, nothing to do and I'm not going to do it. Instead, I'm going to make their word work harder. They can go out and get their own straw. And so Moses then goes back and well, the children of Israel cried to Moses, and Moses goes and cries to the Lord here in chapter 5, verse 22. Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Lord, wherefore hast thou so evil entreated this people? Why is it that thou hast sent me? By the way, God told Moses back on that mountain, he's not going to listen to you. I'm going to have to send my plague. So Moses should have known what's going on here. But Moses says, for since the time I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he has done evil to this people. Neither hast thou delivered thy people at all. Chapter 6, verse 1. Then the Lord said unto Moses, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand shall he let them go, and with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. Lord in all caps is that tetragrammaton, Jehovah. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. That's El Shaddai. That's his name, El Shaddai, God Almighty. He says, but by my name Jehovah, was I not known to him? And that's one of the four verses in the King James Bible. It's actually translated Jehovah. Verse 4, and I have also established my covenant with them, to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. Verse 5, and I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will rid you out of their bondage. And I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. And I will take you to me for a people. And I will be to you a God. And ye shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the good land, concerning the which I did swear to give it to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. 
and I will give it you for an heritage. And then he says, I am the Lord. I do what I say I'm going to do. God says here to Moses in verse 3, unhappy baby back there. God says to Moses in verse 3, I appeared unto Abraham, to Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty, El Shaddai, but by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. I want you to know that the fact actually is that Abraham did know about that name. He just didn't know what it meant. Abraham actually used that name on occasion. In fact, we read in Genesis 13, verse 3 to 4, that he called upon that name. Uh, Genesis 3, uh, 13, verse 3, says, And he went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel, to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Hai, unto the place of the altar, which he had made there at first. And there, Abram called on the name of Jehovah. The Bible says. So he knew the name. But he just didn't know what it meant. And now God's going to reveal to Moses and to the children of Israel what that name means. Jehovah. I am that I am. Is going to reveal to his people through mighty signs and wonders. Even by opening up the Red Sea so they can cross through on dry land. The meaning of his blessed name. He is the, self, the eternal self-existent one. Who is eternal and unchangeable. Always the same, yesterday, today, and, and forever. He was always what He will be, and He will be what He has always been. But also, He delivers His people from their bondage. His name means He is a God who delivers His people from their bondage. Jehovah has no need to bow to Pharaoh or to ask Pharaoh's permission to let His people go. And then God says, verse, back to Exodus 3, verse 15, He then says, This is My name forever. And this is my memorial unto all generations. That means, by the way, that he's the same kind of deliverer for all his people, for all of his saints, in all generations. That means for us as well. Does that mean that we'll never have to suffer? Of course not. But it does mean that when we go through the fire, whatever fire we have to go through, whether it's a fiery furnace endured by Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or whether it's actually the fire endured by Polycarp, and by hundreds of thousands of other martyrs through the ages whose bodies actually were consumed by the flames. The Lord will be with us to go through the fire with us. He will be there. We have nothing to fear as it relates to Jade Helm 15. Personally, I do not think the operation is going to go, uh, the exercise is going to go full-scale martial law, as some are predicting. I don't think it will, but I do think that we need to be prepared for that. We, need to, we do need to have our backup water systems in place, our other, other emergency mode systems in place, as we've discussed several times in this church. We should be prepared for possible EMP strike, perhaps possible heart-generated so-called natural disasters like earthquakes, and possibly even perhaps a, a currency crash, as Steve Quayle predicts. Uh, but personally, I don't think things are going to go that far at this time. I don't think the powers that be are ready for that to happen. I actually side with those who believe this is simply a a demonstration of the shift in policy of the U.S. military to include a central focus here at home and to actually master the human domain as the, uh, the Jade Helm banner boldly uh, declares. You can look online and just do a search for Jade Helm 15 and you'll see the, the logo that they're using, Jade Helm 15, under which it says, master the human domain. That's what they want, they want to do. They want to master the human domain. They, they're, they're the masters and we're the slaves, basically, is the way they see this. They want to tighten the screws and make our chains, I believe, even heavier. So whatever happens, we do need to be prepared. Uh, we need to be wise, but we never need to be in fear. We don't need to be in fear about Jade Helm 15. Hebrews 13.5, I want to remind you, says, Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content which such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. We need to be content with just the fact that we have Jesus. Amen. That's all we need. God's promise to take care of us will be without fail. Because he says, I am that I am. He doesn't change. He's eternal. There's another memorial in the Bible that we've mentioned before. In 1 Samuel chapter 7. 
verse 10 says, As Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with the great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them. And they were smitten before Israel. And the men of Israel went out to Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and smote them until they came under beth Car. And then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen and called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. The Lord, in other words, the Lord brought us this far and therefore we can trust him to deliver us henceforth. Here I raise my Ebenezer, as the hymn says. Hither to, hither by thy help I'm come. God's promise to take care of us will be without fail, because he does say, I am that I am. They that call upon the Lord will be delivered. Isaiah 12, verse 12. says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Another place that name is used is in Isaiah 26, verse 4, that says, Trust ye in the Lord forever. For in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord God, we thank you that you are our memorial. We thank you, Lord, that this is your memorial for all generations. It applies to us as well. You are the great I am. Lord Jesus, you said, before Abraham was, I am. You also are the great I am. And Lord, we just thank you that we can trust in your great promise to, to be with us, to, to shelter us, to protect us, but also to empower us to go through whatever you called us to go through. Pray you'd help us not to be fearful, to be bold, to boldly proclaim your word in this hour. Pray for your grace to do so. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Hymn number 17. Here I raise my Ebenezer. Hither by thy help I am come.